thank you so much and thank you to Chuck and I'm really delighted that you're you're um, joining me today so let's um, let's take a look um, let's see all right I think Keenan I'm gonna did that work uh, let's get you to try that one more time okay so we're looking at the mapping review process and we're going to look at gap analysis and how we inform our maps with assessment and keeping our maps timely. Let's see if we have it. Oh. Okay. Oh, here, sorry, one second here, I'll get it going. Okay. Might be easiest for right now if you can move it forward. I think just so sure. yep. we'll keep it rolling, then I'll try again in a second. All right, very good. So um, very brief thumbnail. For those of you who have joined us thus far, you're aware that we have shared a four-phase model um, in beginning to lay a foundation with a driving mission for your maps, a good purpose. Last session, we dove into what makes a good quality unit map in particular, which is kind of the bread and butter. It's kind of the most fundamental skill set I think teachers need. And, and even if you purchase uh, materials, it gives you a better eye on what to get. I heard from a number of you, um, I received emails about that question. And I think knowing what makes a quality map only will help you um, develop a better sense of what things you can purchase. But the key point here is to remember with text and purchase materials, they weren't designed for your students. They're more generic. And so you're going to need to make adaptations. Today, we're going to dive into informing maps with assessments. And, and then looking at how we can upgrade them. So most of our time will be on the third phase, just for the record. And I wish we had more time to go do more with upgrading. We will certainly try to touch on it with um, some substance. So moving ahead. So in this stage, we review maps to solve problems. And what we're looking at, as you recall, is we thought about gaining information, avoiding repetition, identifying gaps, locating potential areas for integration, matching with learner standards, examine for timeliness, and edit for coherence. There's a lot of reasons to read through maps. But one of the most seminal is, is mapping is a verb. It's a review process. Having the maps, as I mentioned in the very first session, isn't going to help Johnny, Susie, Maria, or Abdul using them well. So what are one of the most important things we can do? It's to analyze gaps and where kids are having difficulty or even gaps because they have strength and we're not giving them enough learning experiences. And to begin to look at this from a larger angle. Now, if I am in an airplane and I'm flying over a, a section of a country, I have an aerial view. I don't see as much detail, but it does allow me to have a bigger perspective. So similarly, in our mapping, when we look at work, say, K through 5 or K through 12, we're going to be getting a bigger picture so we can begin to look at those gaps and then we can zoom in and take more granular steps. Next slide, please. So really what I'm, I think is important is what is the element of assessment. We touched on it last time. An assessment, another word for assessment is evidence. There's a legal term, evidentiary. I really like that term. That if there's no evidence, then you really can't say students are learning. We don't know students are learning because we teach well. We don't think we can't say they're 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 learning because we had a good day in class. Anybody who's taught for a while knows that can be misleading. The only way you know students are learning is by what they produce, what they say, they write, they make they build, they compute, they design. The proof is in the demonstration. So if I am a doctor and you come to me, I make a diagnosis, I assess, I run tests to see what's up. And on the basis of that, on my assessment, I then go, next slide, and I make a prescription. So I take a look at what the problems are and I prescribe another course of action. I prescribe that you perhaps change your diet. I prescribe a medicine. So what's comparable here is that assessment is the basis of your diagnosis. That's where you find out how your kids are doing and, and a whole array of assessments. We talked about that last time too. 
We're not just talking about a standardized test, which is useful, but limited. If I need to know if a student can actually carry out and play in the game, I have to see them as a player. It's not the drill and practice. But if I want to find out how they are in a more finite way with the drill and practice, I look at that. So just like doctors have all kinds of assessments, so do we. But what do we do with it in school? Sometimes we get a lot of assessment data and I'm going, where's it going? What are you doing with it? You see the prescriptions, the curriculum. That's what we give them. That's what we provide for them. Those are what the learning experiences are. It, it, and you know, it can be in social and emotional areas too. It can be in things like self-directed habits. It, if my students don't know how to manage time, then I got to go to my curriculum and I got to give them a new prescription. I got to teach them how to do that and give them more opportunities. There's a beauty to this and a simplicity to this, but a depth to this. Students understand what I just said. And so what I, what I think is important for us is when we dive into assessment, it's not just giving kids a grade. And in fact, sometimes that isn't very helpful to them. It's not just posting a test score. The question here is, is putting together what you have about how your kids are doing and begin to make prescriptions and watch out because guess what? Most of us have more than one doctor. So if I, if I give a prescription to the patient, they're going to go to another doctor. And boy, I'm going to tell you right now, you know what that doctor's going to pull up? Their medical records. They're going to find out what the previous doctors did so that they don't necessarily do something that's counterintuitive. You are, you are absolute professionals and you are in it together. And so what we're collaborating on is inquiry on how to make that work. Next slide. So they're demonstrations of learning. And the whole purpose of an assessment is feedback. That's the whole purpose. It's not to just, it's not to cover things. It's not to say, oh, I had a test. It's the whole purpose is feedback. So I know what to do differently. You know, you go back to that doctor's office and you've lost some weight and you're feeling fit and you're doing really well. The feedback is keep it going. This is working. You know, maybe we'll even do some weight training with you. We'll keep it, you know, the, the point here is feedback is based on evidence. And, and the only way I can improve my performance as a learner is if I have meaningful feedback and I don't get mixed messages from my doctors. Because I could get a lot of good teaching ideas from one teacher in the next year. I go to another one who's totally going in a different direction. The communication in mapping is central to long-term uh, work on the pathway for our, our kids. Next, next one, please. So assessments provide a, a, a direct evidence of, a, a, of progress on a whole array of learning targets. You can look at this list, standards, skills, knowledge retention, reasoning capacity, generative expression, my ability to paint or compose, social emotional dispositions. There's evidence of that. Self-navigation and self-monitoring strategies. Don't think this is just about a test score. That's important, but it's not everything. Next. So we talked about the three tiers last time. I remind you, this time I'm using a music example. There's drill and practice. Will you have assessments on that level? Of course. Are they valuable? Yes. They're, they're valuable if they're purposeful. They're not valuable if they're busy work. And they're important for feedback. Rehearsals or simulations. It's getting ready for the ultimate authentic assessment, the performance where you're the player, you're in the game, you're doing original science, you're publishing that written piece, whether you're in second grade or you're in 12th grade. Next slide. Assessments are observable and can be evaluated for quality and progress made. So whether it is a student writing piece that's tangible, I can pick it up or, or, or a program on a computer screen or something I can see like a rendering let's say of a 3D model or a drawing or a photograph or a test score for that matter, a test, that's one form. But the other is in the moment, like a speech, like a game, like a performance. And so some of the things we see will be observable. They always have to be observable and they can be evaluated for quality and some are measurable quality. There is nothing wrong with quantitative data. It's useful, but it isn't everything. That's the thing to remember. 
I think the other thing is, you know, sometimes people say they want a balance. I don't know if balance is even the word. I think what you need is what's sufficient and helpful and revealing. So if all I had was qualitative, that may not be sufficient. Maybe I need something more quantitative. But the point here is you get evidence by design. Next. Thanks. Keenan, let's talk so, about this one. So yeah, so we talked a lot about at this point just um, how the assessments can live and breathe within your curriculum and quickly wanted to highlight uh, so different ways that chalk is able to help with that. Um, what we have here is just a starting point template, but the, the main point I would really want to get across here is the, the, the fact that the template can exist and what it can do for you, not only when you're creating the content, but when you're going to review, analyze, and, and figure out where do we want to maybe make improvements. So in this layout that we have here, we're looking at different ways that assessments can be um, identified within the system. And, and what I want to draw your attention to is kind of the keywords that have been laid out there. So things like whether it's formative or summative, and we just talked about the different tiers of assessment, which is an option. But really, this is something that you can structure that best matches the terminology that your school uses. So based on that, um, sorry, there's my cursor. So what we can do is, for example, looking at those codes, <clears throat> if we're looking for authentic performance, we have that built in and then we can use that as a way to search across. So if we're in the shoes of having content already in there, we can use that to kind of lay out where do we have authentic performances and then we can couple that with keywords. So if we're trying to look for something that's maybe on a global topic, then it will narrow that down for us and we can jump right into those maps and from here, navigate to where are we seeing evidence of that. So the idea is that because it's all in one place, it just makes it quick and easy to go and find those so that you can have that as um, quick access and do what you need to do, whether you're analyzing it, reviewing it, or, or what have you. So I uh, just wanted to quickly highlight that and we'll get back to the presentation. Thank you. So um, let's, we have a question here. What do you do with your assessment data and findings? I'm just curious. Um, sometimes we have them and we leave each teacher to be on their own. Here's your data. Good luck. Some schools sift through. They have listings of the skill sets and they make recommendations. The question I really have is, is there a formal review process where you go back and look at your maps? Because if there's a gap, then there's probably something missing in the curriculum and it could be over several years of what you do. So let's take just a moment if you want to share what happens in general when you get assessment data. Is it stay with the teacher? Or is there sort of a, a group discussion? Or are there formal, deliberate, vertical reviews? Let's hear from some of you. There's some good practices out there. Be might, it might be nice to share some. There's some good posts. This is great. A lot of references to PLCs. Mm -hmm. I think the PLC movement has been probably one of the most significant helps in making this happen. The key for me, if I might, and just to continue, is we find this, and here's the problem. If I, if we find, let's say in our PLC, that we've got a gap, we have a problem. The question here is where do we go to make the change in the prescription? Often what happens here, and it may not be happening in your setting, and if it isn't, great, believe me. This is what I see is pretty common, is that what happens is everyone goes, here's things we need to work on, but it isn't formally adjusted. So what happens is you still end up with the continued to continuous gaps because we didn't go back to look at what the prescription was. What's the curriculum? Do we need to make more time? Or it's each teacher needs to make the change instead of working more in concert. So sometimes I feel like schools are just on the brink of addressing this. And might I add, I can't think of a more timely thing to be looking at given what we're all dealing with with COVID. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. So as we begin to look at mapping reviews, more formal reviews, 
The question here is what problems can we address to help our learners? That's the reason you come together. And it, and it could be, like I say, a range of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be academic. It frequently is. Have we selected, and this is important because the, the actual work is important, significant and revealing student work to inform our maps. So if we're going to meet together, are we looking at samples, random samples of certain types of demonstrations collaboratively, or are we only looking at scores? Because you may not be getting at the sufficient analysis level. I think many of you would understand exactly what I mean. Here's one of my favorite questions we'll get at. Who should review the work? Um, I think this is what I want to, I'm going to ask, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to be um, thoughtful about this for a moment because sometimes we, we meet out of habit, not out of who should pull together. Um, I want to make the case that I think that PLCs are terrific. I'm a supporter of them. I've helped develop them. They have a certain function, but that is not necessarily who should meet together to look at certain work and problems. I'll give you an example in a moment about this. Remind me, Keenan, about the doctor example. Okay. What formal protocols will guide our review? Because it needs to be formal. What type of data will best inform decision making? Because that's important. Again, do we do it out of habit? Oh, we always meet to look at the scores and why that may not be what you need. And how might we involve learners in the process? That's an interesting question too, isn't it? Maybe there's conditions we need to find out from our kids. To, to look at. Next slide, please. So the whole notion of collaborative inquiry is something that many of you will be familiar with and some of you may not, but it's a sustained process of investigation and it empowers teachers and participants to improve student learning, close the achievement gap, and develop school-wide leadership. It is the basis for what good PLCs are. However, it needs to appear in all types of situations. And what it is, is it's formal. Sometimes work in our schools, the discussions are too informal. Informal is good. I like informal. Informal is great. Let's hang out. Let's talk. Let's get our feelings out. Let's look at what's going on in the school. But sometimes it is not. You do not want your doctors to be too informal with your, your case. You don't. You want, you want it to be formal. Let's take, a, let's take another slide here. So the process is data-driven and a whole array of data, that's the thing I'm trying to get at the most, led by the, listen to this one, the strategic selection of appropriate teachers for the problem. We'll get back to that in a minute. It's structured to promote distributed leadership, so it's not hierarchical. It's focused on certain student learning through a range of assessments, range, remember that. And it's designed to engage teams in creating research-based learning. This is what it is. It's, it's, it's way beyond an interesting discussion. It's formally making our profession, I think it elevates it to a great extent. And, and it really is critical looking at assessment because you're looking at planning what kids are gonna do. And if we don't, then we're each kind of in our own silo, even with good intention. Next slide. So when we look at it in mapping, what we're looking at is the formality of it. We're going to look at aligning this work to generate school-wide improvement or system-wide improvement. It is not only in each class, though that's going to be critical. Each class makes a judgment, a, 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 a assessments and judgments about this, but in conjunction with colleagues. It's the heart of good conversation between teachers. Next slide. Keenan. Great. Um, so just quickly wanted to kind of add to that a little bit and highlight when you're talking about the collaborative process, and I know you talked about kind of a big part of that is being able to collaborate and being able to work in an environment where it's easy to do that. Um, and I just wanted to show how with our, our software platform, what you're able to do, and this is just a quick example that we've pulled up here, where as a teacher, I can quickly review vertically. And if you're in the earlier sessions, this might look a little familiar, where you can kind of look across if I'm focusing, let's say on a topic like fractions, you can quickly highlight that and see where in second grade are we talking about this concept, third and fourth. So that can help drive those conversations with those teachers that you're having. Um, you can share this view, you can bookmark it. So it makes it easy to kind of recall that information. And the other thing too, um, sorry, I've lost my cursor here. 
Uh, there we go. So the other thing too you can do with that is quickly change your context. So using the same tool, just wanted to quickly show how it's possible to change from looking vertically to looking across disciplines in the same grade level with your working maybe with the same group of, group of students rather. And then if we wanted to maybe focus on a topic like debate, then we can kind of see across our social studies and language arts, what are some areas where we maybe can work collaboratively together to further um, empower our students. And again, these are things where you can kind of have this view, dig into it, save it and come back to it later or share it with your colleagues very quickly and easily. So just wanted to quickly highlight that and we'll dive back into the content here to talk more about those grouping options. Yeah, in fact, that's perfect because that's what I wanted to get at. Um, I think there is this on two slides just for the record. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, very yeah. good. Um, one of the reasons I, I really was happy you showed that is to show that you have agility on on who should come together. So let me pose an example very quickly. I'm using medical analogies today, and I think they hold up quite well. I totally recognize it's a different profession. There's different considerations, but there are great analogies here. And one of the analogies is this. Let's say I take a bad fall and let's say I have a heart condition and I, I get a concussion. It doesn't sound very pretty. And let's say, uh, Keenan, you scoop me up and you uh, take me to the nearest hospital. And what's the nearest hospital to you right now? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not in my hometown, so I actually have no idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. I asked you. Okay, so the point, let's, let's say it's General <laughs> Hospital. Okay, yeah. whatever. All right, you, you scoop me up, we go in. And wonder if, Shinjini, you are the receiving doctor there. And you go, oh my gosh, look at her. She's broken her legs, she got a heart thing, she got her head. I am so sorry. I can't pull all the doctors or nurses together because we meet by departments. I'm sorry, we can't do that. We only we only meet on certain levels, or we only meet in the third floor. You're gonna to have to wait next year to go to the fourth floor. Are you hearing me? That we don't always have the right people meeting, or we meet by habit. That the one thing I've got to ask you to be very careful about with PLCs is they got a great function. Let them do a lot of that, but you have to think about who are the right people to come together for a certain problem. So it, let's look at some of these examples. You might want to have, when would you have a need for K-12? I would say 100% when you will start to roll out new standards. I think that's a good example. Do you need it for everything? No. Could you have targeted vertical? This is one of the most important. You just gave an example of that. Maybe what you need are, if you have an eighth grade uh, math problem, it's not an eighth grade math problem. It's probably an eight, seven, six. Maybe it's dealing with something that deals with um, fundamental equations and the idea of, gee, you know, these kids are having a lot of trouble, honestly, with some fraction issues as well. When we consider exponents, let's take a look at how we did it. And by the way, it isn't just that somebody taught it, it's how much time. Maybe it wasn't the right assessment. Maybe we're not finding out if they can do certain things across a grade level. Do we need that? Sure. Do we do it? A lot. But guess where we don't do it? We don't do it in high schools. I think the, the rarest meeting in an American high school is for all the people who teach freshmen to be in a room together. You know, we don't. And, and that's actually what the students say is. So if I'm looking at our kids are all over the place in writing and I'm going, well, maybe we're all over the place in writing too in all our various subjects. The, the idea is this brings a certain freshness. You know, teachers, you should never go to a meeting where it isn't necessary. You shouldn't go out of habit. You don't have time for that. So the idea here is who are the doctors who should come together for this case, for this situation? Targeted cross-grade level. Maybe it's certain members of a team or certain members of a grade level. Next slide. It could be extended team. I think sometimes we leave out in our meetings for specific, it might be for a specific read-through, some of the people who know kids best. Do you know who knows kids really well in elementary schools, physical education teachers, they have them usually the whole five, six years. And so when we're looking at some kid's emotional situation, something might have happened in the gym. Gyms are a place where you see kids differently and they've seen the child over time. Perhaps they shouldn't be part of that sometime or special ed teachers in your buildings, 
Nobody is better trained on how kids learn than special education teachers. Nobody. But let's not invite them to the meetings. So I'm sitting with a math department recently, and they said, I just don't know. These kids are just stuck. I have a big chunk of them. I wish I could figure out how to break it down. I'm going, maybe we should invite a special educator to just one of our sessions, just like doctors bring in specialists. They know how to do this, and they're doing it all the time with really low-level kids. My take is all kids need some form of special ed at some point, and teachers need to learn some of those strategies. We don't even bring in the talent that's halfway there. Feeder patterns is a big deal. So in larger districts, you know, let's say I'm in a district that has five high schools, 10 middle schools, maybe 40 to 50 elementary schools. You know, that's big. Maybe what we should be meeting by are feeder patterns. What are the elementary schools that feed the middle school that feeds the high school? Because that's really what matters here. They're in a different section. They have different learning problems. Kids have different demographics. Whatever the reason, we shouldn't just meet because we always have. We should meet purposely. I think expanded local teams. There are sessions where you want to bring in parents. You might want to bring in community people. We are looking at our maps to figure out a pathway for careers. Invite people to that session. You don't always have to be there forever. And I'm huge on a global team. If you wanted to start to develop when we get to upgrading a global project, are there schools you could partner with in other parts of the world? Could you even bring in, we're starting to do more with virtual faculties and different ways of working. Um, I get really pumped talking about this because it just it's so obvious. And when you've worked in a school that's broken through the tyranny of habitual meetings with the same people, and they start to go, wow, we should bring in people because of their talent or their interest or their engagement. You're going to do a lot better job. And one other quick piece before we go into this. I've never been in a school that can't make this work, ever. You know, when someone says we don't have time, I'm going, well, you're using time now in certain ways. And I get it. I totally get it with COVID. Totally. On some level right now, I'm talking post-pandemic. Please hear me. And I, I understand that. But if you said uh, twice a semester, we're going to have a vertical review of our ELA program in our elementary school and have a representative from each grade level. And we're going to look at the writing and the kids are not being sent home. Maybe we have them do other activities that day or there's certain other experiences. You, you can do it. You know, it, it's, it's like we become victims of the schedule as opposed to looking at the best way to meet. So this is an important one, and I'm, I'm glad you, you brought it up. Let's go to the next slide. So we determine protocols, and any of you in PLCs will recognize this. You want formality. You're looking at the purpose. You'll have prompts and questions. I highly recommend uh, Lois Brown Easton's book on protocols for professional learning. There's a lot of good resources for you to look at different models, but that means there's a timekeeper and that we have certain tasks we do. Um, for example, I did one recently in a New York City district in the Bronx, in our, pardon me, in a, a New York City school in the Bronx, and um, what we were looking at was student writing, and the protocol was that there were samples that were taken, because we were very concerned about how they were doing, both on citywide assessments, but also just in general by fourth and fifth grade, and, and we, we chose random papers, it was a blind read, we all said we were particularly going to be looking for reasoning and crafting complete sentences and some other structural pieces. The protocol was to read them, make your comments. Then when we go around, each person made their comments and their observations about gaps. Nobody knew what grade level they were on. We recorded the findings and then what we did was deliberate over the action steps to take. And it was eye-opening, very revealing. So it's based on looking at work. That's the important thing with assessment, not just talk, but evidence. Let's keep going. So it's critical that the, it's a clear uh, protocol in advance to ensure that all voices are heard and that there are guidelines to review the student uh, work that are fair to the learners involved. But you're also you also set up what's going to be revealing. You're not choosing things that aren't particularly going to give you much insight. And um, and we're not doing it all the time. We do it when we need it. And perhaps you build in a few reviews through the year. Keenan. Thank you. So wanted to quickly highlight, and we can see we've got a, a moving image here, just quickly showing you how 
within your curriculum maps, uh, you're able to establish the protocols that you're creating. So this is just a very kind of high level example to show you that it's feasible to build it right into the maps themselves. Um, and I did want to kind of quickly toggle over and actually show you how that flexibility works. Um, because within chalk, what you're able to do is create your own unit templates. We talked about that earlier with the assessment types and the structure for those. Um, and kind of building on that, and then we can see this, it's very similar to any form builder you may have seen before. And we have all our different fields on the left-hand side. Um, so from here, you're able to customize it. You might want to add something like a reflection field. And then within that, you as a district or school or institution are able to structure this to best match your uh, preferred protocols and the way you'd like that to be established for your learners. So you can include things like hyperlinks, images, videos, what have you. But the idea is it's right there for the reviewers when they're going through that process. You know, one thing I really like about what you're showing us here is so often, I, I don't know, I think some people probably would appreciate this. Uh, there's so many different pieces and so many things in different places. Like we're doing a meeting over here. What is it we're working on? I've got to work on my curriculum here. What I think is pretty cool here is you've got the maps here, but you've got the mapping review protocols here too. So the messaging is this is sort of the central nervous system of everything. And we're, we're, going, to, we're going to message that this is the protocol we're using. You can pull up work from your own um, mapping dashboard and you can, you'll be able to share it. So I like the, the um, cohesiveness of that. I think that's, that's very collaborative. Thank you. Thank you. So again, the idea of collaborative inquiry, which I, I, is, is very obviously cyclical, is you could actually leap in at any point, but this is a wonderful tool that I got from the New York City Department of Education, where I've done a lot of work in the past and, uh, and still continue to, and have great admiration for them, the largest school district in the United States. They have a tremendous professional development team. And one of the things that um, you really are looking at at a school is you're going to be um, examining your student work, sharing your analysis, examining relevant teacher maps, revising them vertically, horizontally, take action with adjusted curriculum, monitor student common assessments, and repeat the piece. Just to be clear, this is my adaptation of their model. What they have is the collaborative inquiry piece, but all we're doing is you could replace this with a lot of different things. But the idea is that it's it's cyclical and you're bringing in the right people to begin to make um, determinations. All right, let's keep rolling. So there's a seven step review process. So, so far what we're saying is have a reason to do this. You know, you're, you're going to look at targeted work. You're choosing who should be looking at this, who are the best people and the, and the pertinent professionals to look at the work. You're choosing what the work is. You're going to have protocols. You're going to build in the time. So now what's the review process? And the first time I developed this was in my first book on mapping, but over the years and multiple books and different ways of working, this has continued to grow and it's, it's applicable in any setting, but you have to scale it to the size of your schools. I totally understand that. I have worked in, in one room schoolhouses where there's literally been three teachers. They are the curriculum, you know, and they are going to do it, but they too, especially because they so much relies on them, need to document their work as much as larger districts. But remember, it's the school where the student attends. That's the key unit. And the school will hand it off to another school. And some kids have very transient lives and there's a lot of movement. But the thing we really want to do is do our best to ensure we're keeping an eye on that path. Remember, curriculum means a path to run in small steps. So first we establish the purpose. Let's run through these. Individual targeted read through. Uh, I'll go, uh, you don't have to go. Oh, back. Sorry, no, sorry. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's all good. It's, it's fine. We're going to go through each of these, I promise. Here we go. <laughs> uh, establish purpose for the review and whether it's going to be across a grade level or vertical or even somebody said diagonal. I went, that's possible. But it's to um, identify the areas that need addressing, whether they're gaps, absences, or redundancies, and to raise central questions. I mean, the idea is issues on ongoing mapping discoveries. We're going to go do an investigative work. You are detectives. You're looking for what's happening and clues. Next slide. 
then we can start by individual targeted read-throughs. One of my very favorite um, educators in the teaching of reading once said something I never forgot, and she said, reading is a solitary act. Um, there's an old axiom that reading is a conversation between the reader and the author. But this, this wonderful consultant, this colleague of mine said, well, the one thing I got to tell you is you can't tell a kid is reading by watching them. You know, they can have the book upside down and look like they're reading, but they're not. Well, here's the point. You don't dive into maps as a group ever. This is Heidi, your coach over here. You can take it or leave it. But I beg of you, until people have done their own reading, you have to mull through this yourself first. You need to take the time. We set that aside before any group meeting. And that's one of the things that I think contributes to some of our problems is people aren't prepared. They, they, they need to, to be able to look through the designated grade level. So maybe it's grades two through five. We're concerned about our, our kids' ability to shape paragraphs. They have a weak vocabulary and they're having trouble with sentence starters. Let's look at samples of writing, two, three, four, five. Those are the things we're going to look at. Do we need every teacher? No, but we need a good representation from each of those that we're going to look through those pieces. Before I come to that meeting, I need to have looked at those samples of those kids through the grade levels, and I need to be prepared to make my observations and commentary. Then when we come together, it's going to be a lot more productive. Let's keep going. We collect data on the areas of focus. So one of the things we begin to look at is we begin to look at what are the problems with the um, assessments. And then we can start to look at the maps. So if I'm looking at those writing papers I just mentioned, then as a group, we begin to look at are there gaps in grades two, three, four, and five. I mean, people are working on paragraph work, but how much? How are they assessing it? Do we have some holes? Are there some things that are actually really working well that we want to keep? We look at possible repetitions. There's a difference between a redundancy and a spiraling piece. And just, you know, we want to distinguish those. What about the depth of understanding? Is it, are we too superficial? Are we only assessing on this first level? So when they get older, they haven't had a chance to take a deeper dive. Are these aligned to standards? And so in our work, we begin to collect things. We don't make any decisions on action yet. We're just going through to begin to make observations of potential areas where, hey, maybe there's some things we could do a little differently. There's some things missing here. And the idea is to not get defensive. As doctors, doctors have to do their very best. And they all recognize everyone has limitations. And we all recognize there's a lot of variables. But you don't want them covering up in a case they have, to, they have to say, you know what, this medicine didn't work. Or they have to. They take an oath. And so the idea here is to be highly professional in what that looks like. Let's keep rolling. Then out of that, we look at some potential areas for immediate revision. That means there's some things, and this doesn't get talked about enough, there's some things you can actually do very quickly. That's what's very interesting about mapping especially when I've got a software platform. So if I've got chalk or whatever software platform, but we're working with chalk right now, uh, and I want to make a change, I can. And we might say, for example, you know what? Um, we, have, uh, we have a problem here. Our kids aren't doing enough sustained writing. We are getting complaints from some of the older grades that when they come forward, they're really not able to shape a longer term piece of writing. They're very good at short paragraphs, but how are we doing this? Are we doing, is it only in English? Are there other classes? What might we do? Keenan? Thank you. So um, we're gonna kind of expand on that a little bit and we'll dive in. And once I get it pulled up here, Dr. Jacobs, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to kind of talk a little bit further about what we're gonna look at here. Um, so in that example, of kind of talking about furthering the expanding of writing and looking at other areas where we might be able to do that, um, as teachers, you might determine like, okay, well, in social studies, I know we have a unit where we're going through the Russian Revolution, there might be some opportunities there. So one way, sorry, my cursor keeps disappearing. There we go. So one way we can maybe address that is um, if we're looking to find that content very quickly from the platform, we can just start by typing in that keyword. So we're just gonna type in Russian Revolution. From our mapping, we can 
hone in directly on the course where we're teaching that. And then from here, we can actually go directly into the specific unit where we're covering those concepts. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into that here. And with our search, it's actually highlighted for us within there where are we talking about the Russian Revolution specifically. So we're not, we're not looking to change our big ideas or big questions. What we're looking for um, is some of those procedures that we're doing with the students. So when we come in here, this is the area where we might have determined ways that we would want to improve this. So I'm just going to pull it up here. And before we look at what we're actually going to put in, um, Dr. Jacobs, would love to hear from you kind of your analysis of looking at this and, and what maybe he's missing from it right now. What, when I first looked at this, I went, if in fact, out of a review, we found that there aren't sufficient, there's not sufficient evidence of the student's ability to really put together a meaningful piece of writing or a response in its sixth grade, and we want them to start to do this. Um, and these were the standards we identified that students are able to write an argumentative or a, a persuasive essay. What I see is probably some really great experiences that they're gonna do a reader, reading with a graphic organizer, they're going to get in small groups, they'll do takeaways from their analysis, they've got a nice, I love it when we use media purposely. But what I think isn't here is we don't have something substantial and, and that's missing when we look vertically. So let's add an assessment. So let's say now everyone is to add a summative assessment, something much more significant. We'll begin with sixth grade and we'll begin to scaffold those six, seven, and eight. And we're gonna do it in every subject. So whether it's in social studies or in science. So if you have all your teachers doing that, it'll make a difference. Let's put in the one that, um, that uh, you know, I put together. Hmm. So I was using the analogy of a cooking show earlier because it makes me think of like the time it takes to build that when you put it in the oven, then you take it out and it's done. We're, we're doing that right now. Um, so this is one right. way where you could drop that assessment. So basically what it is now we have a summative assessment and the students would know about it in, in advance. And in this instance, the question is, was the Russian revolution inevitable? Did it have to happen? That are right, let's say 500 words. That may sound like a lot, but you know what? It really isn't that much if you begin to take it over time, or maybe you make it less, but here's the point. They, the arguments have been, the arguments are clear, carefully um, described, what needs to appear, who the audience is. And they're actually gonna have a real audience. This is a real one, by the way. And there was a university close by that had a Russian studies department and the grad students there agreed to look at student papers and just give them some comments. So they're gonna really get some nice feedback on this. I, I suggested that maybe, in fact, what the, the what we've had is Time Toast, which we won't go into right now, but it's a terrific app that allows you to make interactive timelines. So they could they could populate that with photographs of the Russian Revolution that are available and or um, um, other pictorials. They could do paintings for that matter. It's a very rich uh, Russian art tradition that, uh, or uh, uh, I don't want to say tradition, but I'm just going to say there was a very rich period of uh, Russian art that portrays those periods. And then you have your commentary. So now we've got an interactive timeline. We've got this piece and we've really got a terrific summative assessment that would allow us to go back and say with more, more confidence that our students are working on those standards. Would you do a lot of these? No, but we're gonna have them. And now we're gonna look at seventh grade. And in seventh grade, they're gonna be looking at maybe something like government and they'll be doing one. And as you continue on, you'll see how this builds. And you actually start to get a student portfolio of what's pretty meaningful work. Thank you, Keenan. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we'll continue on with our presentation here. So one of the other things is sorting short-term and long-term. Um, and I think this is real important that if we just all said, each of us is, needs to design that summative assessment, and we can do it. We've got our chops, we'll share what we're doing we're not doing it randomly, just the opposite. Six, seven, and eight is coordinating. Also, they should look at what's going on in five. You know, we should really be building this. But some things are gonna take more time. I mean, I, I, I right now I'm working with several districts that are going through an old, only old world, I can say, as a curriculum overhaul in math. <laughs> it's a big deal. They're changing programs. They're gonna, they really need to shake it up. They want a lot more shift from process math to more applications 
with more authentic opportunities and their shifting pedagogy and the, the textual spine they're using, that's not quick. That's long term. And there's implications for other classes. I mean, you change math, you got to look at your physics program too, because physics is applied math. And so the point here is you also can use this as a launching pad to say, look at the evidence. It's pretty solid that we have a K-12 math problem and this is where we're going. Or we're looking at the evidence and during COVID, we have had real learning loss, significant. You know, you're going to have some learning gains too with that, but there's going to be a lot of kids maybe who've lost. We, we need to take a hard look at how we're going to look at what to cut, keep, create into next year and how we're going to group our kids. It's not immediate. The point here is some things are, some things are not. Your team can make those recommendations. Next slide. Long range planning. Keenan? Oh, sorry. This was just to elaborate on the this first point here. Okay. Um, so uh, whenever I see one of those, I think, well, you can go back. Let's just look at it. You put, you, you put it up. <laughs> uh, so basically, as I do long range planning as a teacher, it also may mean, you know what? As a, as a group, we've made decisions. We've got to take more time on this. Or I got to take a look at this. You know, right now in schools, I'm working with right now a lot on how to deal right now with what to cut, keep, create, given the crisis we're all in and such tough evolving learning environments with hybrid and home learning online and also at school and social, it's very hard. We're doing a lot of cutting back. I think the, the point here is you don't do it randomly. You've got to be very thoughtful about it. What's in the foreground? What are we going to keep? What might we create? So that this ability to be able to go, you know what, I'm going to take some of this out of this unit and more, more emphasis here. This is really important, but for the long range planning, it's critical so that you can you can scope it out, but that you could look at other teachers maps too. It's just it's just terrific. Gee, I, I you spent a lot more time on this than I realized this is going to be really helpful for me that that kind of thing too. Okay. So then then the key is making plans. So you remember we went through the diagnosis. And then we're going to prescription now. So we're looking at making changes in curriculum like we just did in that last example on the Russian Revolution. But it also may mean we got to change instructional models and approaches. It may mean the gap is because there's too, there's too much teacher-directed learning and we aren't getting enough evidence that students can actually follow through on tasks. Or um, we find, we're finding that we need to work better at teaching strategies on grouping kits and things like that. The, the, the idea here is, is that out of this work, we, we want to be stakeholders in our own learning in our schools and begin to set up procedures for monitoring uh, formative assessments, keeping ready to watch the cycle and determining what our next steps will be when we're going to meet again to see if the changes we made made a difference. So I think that the last slide here is, is, is very important and that we're looking at, um, go to the next one, is to keep the cycle continuing. Okay. That's right. All right, so let's go to the next one. So, share in your chat. What are some of your takeaways from this review? Maybe it's, it validates a lot of what you're doing, but are there some things that are a little different? Maybe like the, the targeted read-throughs and who reads, and also the process of working so closely in conjunction with the maps. Um, if any of you would like to share in this chat, let's take, uh, let's take 30 seconds. I'm going to drink a little of my tea and... We'll do that. Awesome. Um, so just a quick reminder for everyone in the chat for when you're sharing, if you set it to panelists and attendees, that's really helpful. It just kind of make sure that everyone who's in attendance here can see those posts. Uh, and while folks are filling that in, I do, there's a question that came in a little earlier and I'd, I'd love to kind of just throw it out right now, just while we're kind of waiting for the chat to start rolling in. Uh, and I think it's actually kind of relevant to some of the things we talked about here. So I'll go ahead and read that question that came in. Uh, from Cameron Copeland. So the question is, I am part of a small private school with six teachers uh, admin total. Do you see an issue with one well-informed person working on the initial mapping process and then working collaboratively with the others to refine it? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that you, I think the idea here is it's the nature when you say initially, I think the one thing I'd be looking at is, is how are you going to start initially? In other words, if it's 
I'm going to lay out a working draft of a scope and sequence of units. And you are informed by the people there. I think that's very doable. I think if you can't leave it to one person to map everything, but if, if you've come to some agreements about somebody's strengths in assisting you, and they're very adept and very attuned to what others are doing, and you have limited time and resources, I think you can absolutely get started. I think the bottom line, though, is it's, it will be somebody else's plan until you, in, unless there's conversation involved. So, yeah, I, I think that's real. I think, you know, sometimes we have to divide and conquer and, and share those responsibilities. Um, there's no question, you know, we'll get into this in a minute with consensus mapping, and maybe I should save it for there. So I'm going to save more on that. But I appreciate the question, and I wish you every success there. Okay, we're getting a few things rolling in. Some of the there's specific steps that seem to grab some people's attention. Yeah, it looks like the targeted read throughs come up a few times. Yes, I think that's actually probably the biggest surprise people have is they realize how often they go to meetings and it's the same people and it's the same thing. And they, how often have you been in a meeting? I don't know. Could we get a raise hands thing? Do they have that? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. How many people? have actually gone to a meeting where you go, I don't know why I'm here. I have no reason to be here. <laughs> all right, my screen just got blocked with all the raised hands notifications, <laughs> so I can't count <laughs> a lot. Okay. I made my point. <laughs> made my point. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. It just, you know, and here's one interesting thing, though, before we move on. In business, that doesn't happen. You know, time is money in a business. I, I, I work with businesses. I've worked with software platforms. I've worked with publishers. I've worked with companies before and continue to. You never go to a meeting unless you need to be there. They don't do that. They don't. It's pretty, pretty clear in hospitals, too. The right nursing staff is invited. They don't bring people in another wing if they shouldn't be there. We do it all the time. We, we meet endlessly in meetings where we shouldn't be there. And given virtual tools, we shouldn't be there for everything. So um, I think the key here is this is purposeful, it's strategic, it's, it's, it's mission driven in that you're looking at, your mission is to get the assessment data out. Let's keep rolling. We're doing pretty well on time, I think. Yeah, yeah, we've gotten a couple of good questions. I just wanted to let you folks know, we are gonna do a little bit more in-depth Q&A at the end, but just for time's sake, we're gonna keep going here. But uh, please do really appreciate the questions. If anyone has questions as we're going through, make sure you put them in the Q&A. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. So I'm just gonna keep going here. All right, so here's another level of work, and that is um, developing consensus maps. And this is, this is another level of work, and it's a determination of to what extent, let's go to the next slide, please. To what extent are you, are you going to really be looking at the issue of reaching some commonalities? It's interesting that the really deep meaning of the word consensus is acknowledgement of truths. I find that really interesting. It doesn't mean necessarily compromise. It's reaching consensus in, in regarding curriculum. If we go to the next page, next slide, please. It, it, it is deciding on if you're going to have a common map. It, it, people use different words. They say master map, consensus map, essential map, core map, collaborative map. Are you going to have a common map that everyone works off of? And then in addition, each teacher will have their own adaptation. Or are you saying everyone will have their own curriculum map in your school? Some of that will be your philosophy in your school. Some will be your size. Some of it will be, can you go to the next slide? Some of it will be based on um, whether you want each teacher to be highly responsive and sort of follow the lead of students. There's certain schools I work with um, um, schools based on a, on, a, on a pedagogy of everything should come from the students. There's others that are quite strict about what it is you think is important and you believe in that. So here's the interesting question. I was asked this for years early on. I was, they were saying, well, don't you think there should be one map for everybody? And I'm going, yeah, but you know what? Doctors have guidelines, but they have to make adaptations for patients. But they have guidelines. But you know, not all patients are the same. You can't say I've seen one human being, I've seen them all. 
you know, it, it, it's, it's that you have, you know, there's sort of an interesting tension. So the two questions I've, I've written about and really like to think about is in your student population, specifically to you, and the size, whether it's that school with six people or it's 25,000 kids, the question here is where is consistency going to be critical for your students learning in the curriculum? And there will be places. Where is flexibility equally as important? So maybe what you're going to say is, look, let's be consistent that in fourth grade, all students will be introduced to historical fiction. I didn't just choose that out of a vacuum because I've been to a lot of school districts where I'll just even say this to a group of K-12 English teachers. I'll say, who introduces historical fiction? And nobody knows. And I'm going, well, you better find out because they're not going to necessarily get it themselves. We could say, okay, it'll be fourth grade. Fourth grade will introduce it. Do they all need the same book? No. We'll be flexible on that. Do they all need to teach it at the same time? Of course not. Will you use some of the same standards? Yes. We may do some adaptation. The point here is with curriculum, common sense should be there that there, there is a degree where consistency is really important. I don't think in math you want your elementary teachers saying, you know, I am really tired of division. I'm just getting rid of it. The world is too divided. I'm done. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. But you could, I think, very clearly negotiate certain areas of emphasis that really probably aren't so important and where flexibility will play out. The point here is it's a policy decision and it's going to be based on where you live, what your national policies are, whether you're in an independent school or a religious school or a government school. And in the United States, it's property. You know, schools are funded by property rights. So it's or taxes. So it's it, it it's a very complex thing. But I, I think it would be naive to just say, oh, do it this way. But this is important so that you know where you can, what you can count on. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, you can then move to this idea for um, benchmarking. If you elect to, if you decide you're going to have um, more, you want to have a consistent place where you're driving the curriculum and you're going to pull to the side of the road periodically and check in and have a common benchmark assessment with some flexibility that's a policy that makes sense. And boy, does mapping help you with that because you can literally put that on that calendar where it's going to be and you can make determinations about that also in those vertical reviews. Next slide. So you can also do cornerstone assessments. My good friend and colleague for over several decades is Jay McTighe. And one of the things Jay has written a lot about is the difference between a cornerstone assessment and a benchmark assessment. And I think he's right that a cornerstone assessment could be a place where we give kids an opportunity, like maybe it's a capstone project or an unusually um, exciting personalized project to demonstrate interest in a, a problem or an issue and carry out an investigation. It could be at any level. But we want to make sure that happens too, because we've got a mission to show more self-directed learning in addition to more classical forms of assessment, which might be closer to the benchmarking. One way or another, you've got to give teachers some flexibility. They've got real patience. They've got real kids. They've got to adapt. But at the same time, you're kind of dealing with that interesting tension, which is a healthy one, between where are you going to pull over and, and look at some consistency. Next. So you can see policies that go all the way from highly flexible with no end of unit tests, teaching units when you choose a free choice of uh, materials all the way to the other end where you might have common end of unit uh, tests during unit assessments and you teach, you teach your units in a pretty thoughtful, um, uh, I hope thoughtful uh, pacing piece. And I think we can overdo that, but I do understand there's places that have that policy because that's how they have founded most success with their kids. So the point here is, is when you're mapping, I'm just saying, again, let's take the, 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 the aerial view. This has a lot to do with how I'm going to plan on the, on, the, on the teacher level. And sophisticated planners keep this in mind and communicate it clearly. Otherwise, it feels furtive, like I've got an assessment here, I've got an assessment here, as opposed to um, uh, more uh, coherent in, in a way as a plan. Next slide. 
so wanted to kind of elaborate a little bit on that, uh, the idea and that, that constant tension that always exists. I know in my experience in working with districts over the past few years, um, it's, it's real and, and finding that what works best for you, it's, it's definitely true that there's not one right answer. And I think kind of drawing back, like it, for those of you at the first webinar, I know that kind of one rule that you said, Heidi, and please tell me if I'm saying it wrong, but we all have to agree on one thing and that we're doing this for the learners, right? So kind of looking at it through that lens, one of the things that I wanted to quickly highlight um, with the way that chalk is structured um, and what we're looking at here is kind of the main dashboard of chalk just to highlight the the ones I wanted to point out are curriculum which is what we've talked about so far and that is very much universal for your whole institution whether you're a small school whether you're a large district or maybe even your group within a school <clears throat> excuse me this is where everything lives it's universal everyone's kind of working from that same content the how you structure that you can map that and create that to match what you want your maps to look like, whether you want to have one map that's universal across all your groups of students that are in grade four, or whether each teacher is able to create their own maps that is entirely up to you and your institution and how you want to structure that. And then on the other side of the equation, we have our plan board lesson planner. So the, the really great thing that we wanted to highlight here is how these two pieces are connected to each other. So depending on where you land on that spectrum, you can set up both the curriculum side and the plan board side to map to how you would like that to work for you. And the main thing here that I wanna highlight is that the plan board side is unique to each individual. So this is where you can really make it flexible to your needs. So I'll quickly show you what one sample can look like. And this is very much just one example is you might prefer having your fully daily schedule laid out with all the details when you have morning announcement, when you have lunch and have that structured that way. Others might prefer it maybe a little bit less detail. Maybe it's just somewhere where I can keep all my content organized for my English class day to day and it's not reflective of my calendar. Maybe I just wanna have somewhere central where I can go access my tasks and keep things, keep on top of things and make notes day to day however you wanna use it. But the idea here is that because those pieces connect, it really does empower you to choose where you want that kind of, I guess, um, flexibility versus consistency line to be on that spectrum from that slide. And you're able to do things like from my lessons, if I want to leverage certain pieces from my curriculum, I can access those. If I want templates for my lessons, I can create those. They can be school level, they can be teacher level. But the idea is that it is very much customizable in that way so that you can hopefully find where that, where that medium is that's right for you and more importantly, right for your students. Let me let me just make a, a point here because here's what I'm hearing. Um, I think there's two tiers of what we've been talking about on flexibility and consistency. I think what you just described is that as an individual, I have a lot. I need flexibility. I need to be able to. I'm an adult. I'm a professional. I got to be able to figure out the best way I can uh, fly this plane. I mean, I'm I get it. I think the other side of it is I'm going to have more confidence in the school if I have a combination of that. But if my school is clear, if my district is clear about what the expectation is in terms of where are we going to be consistent on certain types of assessment experiences and where do I have a lot of leeway as a teacher on doing my own formative. So what was interesting to hear you describe here um, that I'm hearing sort of for the first time in a way is that um, what you feel is that chalk can do it on both levels. And that's really interesting to me. Um, okay. Let's keep rolling. I'm looking at the time. I think we're doing pretty good. I look over at Shinjini and I'm trying to be a good, trying to be good here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's touch briefly on my favorite step that we have the most limited amount of time. <laughs> um, I have uh, my dear colleague, Marie Ubley Alcock and I, who've known each other for a long, long time, wrote a book together called Bold Moves for Schools. And I wrote a, a, a series for Solution Tree on digital literacy, media literacy, global literacy, how to lead them. And a book called Curriculum 21 a few years ago with ASCD about the modernization of schools. It, it, I'm obsessed with it. Absolutely. I, I feel like what we often have are 19th century structures, the same school year, same school day, still schools and self-contained. Some schools still have the same old types of chairs. None of you would want to sit in one of those metal chairs at home. You wouldn't rush home and say, bring out the high school chair. The, the, the point here is we've got those structures, same old schedules, everything. We have basically 20th century curriculum. Most places 
the curriculum doesn't look all that different from 1990. I'm not joking than what we do now. But we have 21st century kids and we have more 21st century teachers. So in a sense, what we're really trying to do here is have a curriculum, a learning program that matches the needs of the modern learner as preparing them to move forward. There's no coverage here. It's got to be actually discoverage and, and being able to really make some replacements. So upgrading, when we upgrade anything, is a replacement. It's an instead of. So one of my favorite things to do with this is that we literally and, and, and very deliberately will sit with teams. And the reason for the read through is to look for places where we can replace a dated practice, a dated assessment, dated content with more upgraded modern forms of learning and interaction. We're very deliberate about it. And so what it is, is it, it's very exciting, and, but it can't be haphazard. It can't just be cherry picking. Right now, a lot of people go and go, oh, I'll just add this app. I think it's quite different than that. And so one of the bigger questions is the content question too. Let's keep rolling. We'll just touch on this and then get to some questions. But again, this is my favorite. <laughs> I really love looking at this idea of breakthroughs and new standards and contemporary issues. And so we may pull together a vertical, a horizontal group, say it's across ninth and 10th grade in a high school. And we take a hard look at the actual program. You know, it's actually, actually interesting tomorrow morning, uh, early morning, I am working for the day with a, a wonderful um, high school group in Florida. And we are literally looking at totally revising the way courses are designed. And the number one thing is to keep them fresh, modern, crisp, and relevant. And we're going to take some of the traditional courses. We're going to keep the best of them, but we're going to begin to shed. We're going to be looking at where do we have more international perspectives, where we're going to have more modern forms of expression. And it's the deliberate need to put juice in the curriculum. Because if you want students engaged, they need to be engaged in right now learning. And it goes for younger kids too. Let's keep on rolling. So I do think there's the three media, the three literacies, and I would argue that most, um, most children really aren't, and, and high school students are not digitally literate. They're not. They, there's one thing to have digital access. That doesn't make you literate. I mean, how many of you know a, a student who goes to a browser and takes the very first thing that comes off? That, that's like going to the library and say, oh, just give me the first book. You've seen one. Yeah, they all look the same. Binders and all that stuff. The, the, the idea here is to be literate, is to make meaning, not just to access. Um, quick point, and there's people in these languages who will appreciate this. Um, I can decode, as an English speaker, I can decode. I can ask, access the code to Portuguese, Spanish, French, Romanian, and Italian. But I'm not literate in those languages. I'm not fluent. I can just access it. I, I can go to Rome and I can decode how do I get to a hotel and I can decode it, but I don't, I don't speak it. The point here is in curriculum right now, I look at it and I, I, I see people using tools, but I don't know if we're really working at literacies especially media literacy these days, the flood of it, not only to be better and more discriminating users, but to make better quality. So in our assessments, we'll go through and you'll see a, a little chart that indicates some of that and literally start to do upgrades, replacements of what that might work on. And, and global literacies are using the tools we have. Look right now at this event, you, we literally have people on the other side of the world participating and bless your hearts, you know, I, it's probably four in the morning someplace in Shanghai, and there you are. We had Auckland last time, and we have Serbia, and, and we have all over. And, and students have that availability, but we miss it out. I'm amazed how often teachers aren't connecting with schools in other parts of the world or the other part of Tom. So the point here is, is we deliberately go for a global search. Where are places where we could expand and create that possibility? Next slide. So Keenan, do you want to pick up on this or should I just comment on it briefly? Uh, yeah, we can, I think we can keep rolling here. Um, we can so, so here's the deal. And this is part, part of a, an image. Um, 
that that is sort of an, a list that I've generated lists with teachers of all kinds of modern day types of assessments. So what do modern day scientists produce? Well, they don't produce five paragraph essays. I can promise you that. It's a pretty good rehearsal, but that isn't what they produce. In fact, one of the things that happened recently, I was working with a high school who did a virtual visit to a oceanography lab, a virtual visit, and they asked the scientists there, what do you produce? And they said, grant proposals. So the teacher went back and the kids are writing grant proposals for an environmental site. Or instead of a poster, maybe it's a podcast we work on. The point here is there's such a wealth of assessment types, I think that can really make a big difference. Next. We also want to try to create um, clearing houses that really allow um, our students to really um, engage in some really exciting opportunities. Um, do we have time to just go very quickly here? Yeah, yeah, we'll quickly toggle over here. All right. So this is the clearinghouse for Curriculum 21. That's my website. And so if you go to the top and you hit clearinghouse, go back, hit clearinghouse again. Sorry, I lost well, actually, you know what? This is OK. Go under home and hit show. And next to show, hit the tags. And what you see is these are literally probably about a thousand websites. Um, that have been recommended by teachers. So if you go down, let's say to science, can you find the science tag there? Let's just scroll down and take a look at that. There we go. Almost there. Good. All right. So we click on the science tag and what happens, and you'll see where it says next, there's pages, if you just scroll down, pages of tools and websites and resources. So that if I'm working with the science department, we very quickly can go, what are additional tools and possibilities? Here's the point, you're welcome to use this, but, and it's free, but everything. But I think each school should have a clearinghouse where you have a reservoir that's tagged, not just a long list, but tagged and categorized. And guess who should submit them? Your students. They should annotate and say, here's a great resource that I could use in writing or in different areas. Let's go back to the slides. The point here is when a school takes on this goal of modernizations, the maps get electric. It's terribly exciting to see the possibilities when you begin to make that happen. Next slide. The other is content, and I'm just using this as one example. But you know, when you look at the 17 partnership goals for sustainability from the United Nations and you look at wonderful projects or different ways of working. Um, there, there's so many resources available to keep your curriculum fresh and modern and also to partner with groups, it, whether it's the other side of town or the other side of the world. What we do is we can search our maps because we have them there. It's so much easier as opposed to what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And we can begin to work in collegial teams to create this. This is probably one of the most exciting parts of the work these days for me in mapping is this idea of modernization. There's no question about it. I like to get kids involved in doing that too, looking at the maps, quite honestly. I really enjoy doing that. Next slide. So teams formally do read throughs, just like we talked about before. But remember we said we started with a purpose? So the purpose would be to look for upgrades, to look for opportunities to do assessment replacements or add new content or add new digital or media or global skills and where that sensibly makes, play, makes sense. So we can maybe do some cutting back and some creating of new opportunities. All right, here we go. All right, uh, so wanted to take a quick second to say thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs. Really, really appreciate this. And I like to your point, there was a lot of content in there. I know we barely skimmed the surface on that last one. Um, but I do want to give some time because we've got a few questions here. Uh, while we're going through the questions, I will leave up uh, these resources uh, for Dr. Jacobs. So these are different ways you can access your content. Curriculum21.com is actually where that clearinghouse we were just looking at is. So you can go find that there. You can reach Dr. Jacobs by Heidi at Curriculum21.com or on Twitter uh, with the handles here. So I'll just leave that on the screen and we'll dive into some questions. Um, and there's a couple here around timing. And the first one here I'm going to read about is uh, going back to the cycle that we walked through. So like I get the, the cycle. And when at the end, we talked about the cycle continues. And the question here is uh, a timeline. So it's, and, and there's a caveat in the question of some, obviously, it might be varying 
depending on each individual, but um, do you have any sort of kind of suggestion as to what kind of timeline the cycle takes for one go around? Well, that's really a good question. Um, uh, there's, there's two or three things to think about. I think one of the things is when the, when a school is well oiled in terms of collaborative approaches, and there's a fairly high degree of trust and professionalism, things move much more rapidly than um, when, when schools have not met this way and there can be more tension and they're not used to the protocol. Schools that have done PLCs tend to pick up on this quickly. So one thing that will dictate the time is the readiness level of people, one. Two, I'm gonna be honest with you, some schools may have some very strong teaching work, but they haven't had much work looking at assessment and learning how to look at the skill set. So, so one other thing that would help is preparation on whatever it is you're looking at. So um, uh, it, 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 it's learning how to analyze student work and, um, and the specific work at hand. So those, those, those variables will have a lot to say about how much time it takes. But let's assume you're in pretty good shape that way. And you're, you're looking at looking at some samples. You don't want to have an extremely large group. You want to have a working size. I would say 8 to 12 is maximum. And, uh, and, and what you're going to really be doing is the preparation in advance, which partially is going to be a question of a person's own schedule and how they, they work it through. But in looking through student work, you're probably, for something formal, you're going to probably need to have an hour or so on your own. And then in the session, we like to time them. And I don't like to see those meetings go more than an hour and a half if we can help it. So for a review piece, you're coming with concise observations. You've got protocols that are formal. So it isn't like, oh, I kind of like this one. You're commenting on some specific things. You weren't doing a lot of extraneous stuff. If we're really looking at whether students can do opening paragraphs, they're able to use good reasoning, they can do citations and vocab, that's what we're talking about. If time allows, you're going to have some other observations or you can document those. But if everyone stays on point and you have a gatekeeper, that round should take about 90 minutes. Then the question is meeting afterwards. And depending on the um, way you're, um, whether you have the additional time, then you can begin to look at sorting what's immediate, what's long term. What are recommendations? It may be the long term is you're not ready to solve it, but you're ready to say we need some professional development. Our, our, our teachers really need this. Um, one of the things we know, and I'm bringing up math again, was um, math relies so much on language capacity. It's a reading problem for so many kids. They can't read the math. They don't, they're, they're not particularly good readers, and they're given a complicated math problem, especially on a test. They they really actually might know the math, but they have trouble with the reading. So maybe the PD we find is we need to do some work on reading strategies and math classes. You know, it can be um, so many different angles in, but I think you don't make a decision right away. You can sort right away, but you need to have a little bit more of a delayed response and look at our next wave. Who should we bring to the table to look at how we address the problems that have emerged? So a whole cycle like this, um, I like to see them through the course of a year at least three times, sort of formal review cycles. And you don't necessarily have to review everything. I mean, if things are functioning fairly well and kids are doing pretty well, then I don't think it's necessary. But if you have a high risk or you're having a lot of trouble, then I think you can skew towards more of that opportunity and should probably leave a good two hours for a formal review with the time for teachers to do preparation in advance. Awesome. Um... We got uh, another question here. This is this. I'll, I'll admit this is a little bit niche, but I, I do want to be, ask it because it's very detailed, and I, and I think it raises a good point that um, everyone kind of has their own situation they're in. So um, this is from Allison Hart Frank, and the question: uh, She works for Job Corp, which is a two-year program uh, working with disadvantaged youth, so high school dropouts from the age of 16 to 26. Uh, she has students that enter the classes at different times. So they're all in different core classes or if in the same class, usually on different sections. Um, there's also an AB schedule with the trades. So being in that constant state of change, it can be difficult to plan for more than a week at a time. And I guess she's just kind of looking maybe for some advice. Uh, so there's no students every week and students that graduate and are out of class. 
Um, I, it kind of ends up in, in the end, could you help me uh, with making this work for me? So I, I know there's a lot there, but maybe there's some kind of guidelines or, or kind of helpful tips that you could provide to her. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I am aware I have worked with programs in over the years. Um, uh, in particular, I'm reminded of a program that was outside the Chicago area that was for students who were kind of like last chance. They'd been uh, basically told them they were suspended and um, they would come in sort of waves. And we were, part of the program was to give them some type of skill set to give them work. But the morning they had to work on their academic program, but they, they said they would come back. They worked with those kids and they were ages um, 12 to 22. And what we realized is the most important thing was to really keep a good record on the kids that if even if you have them for the week, shift the focus less on your coverage, keep track of what you're, you're working on. But the main thing is to have that student involved in seeing what they did wherever they go next. And sometimes they return. So in a database, you can do that. Um, a number of years ago, uh, when I was teaching at, at, at TC at Columbia, I had someone who worked in homeless shelters and that's the most transient environment I know. And one thing we were attempting to do at that time is it was the same idea. Like you didn't know where the student was coming or going, but somebody was monitoring at least what that experience was and what the student's reaction was to it. So if you're working with kids in short term, have short term goals and let's see how they do it and let's see what they respond to. Or maybe there was an area of interest, but I think the important thing would be to involve them. And, and, and for you to have, given the environment you have, and you know your population better than anybody, is laying out what's workable and realistic, and what are going to be some of my learning targets. And I would change the language to learning target language, like I can statements and stuff like that. And even if it's, um, you could even have it sort of tiered, here's a menu of some learning experiences you can have while you're with me here. And I can prescribe these, and I have some for those of you who are more ongoing. But don't make yourself crazy. You can only give so much. But you can do some good here. And I really just feel part of it is for the student to be owning it. If Otherwise, they're passive. It's, it's drive-by as opposed to driving in. You may be with me for a few days, but I'm going to make them good. And um, the other is to give students a lot of online resources. So many students, even with just their smartphones, you give somebody something really interesting, and you kind of, you never know where that'll play out. So, and, and uh, a lot of credit to you it shows a tremendous amount of resilience on your part. I think we have time for one more. Okay. Um, so, I guess uh, this is this is kind of a two-parter question. There's a couple of questions that are focused. On, I'll phrase it this way: um, Is there a good time specifically for curriculum mapping? Like when is the best time? And, and when you're starting that process, is it best to start with one subject across a district? I'm asked those two questions often. And I, I would say, um, sure. I think there's better times of year than others based on where you are. Um, I, I think also given everything we're working on and dealing with right now, it may seem like now isn't the best time. Can I tell you a little something? I think you should be really looking at the long game coming up very soon. You're going to do your best to get through this period of the pandemic, but the long game post pandemic is what we really need to be looking at. And we really need to be mapping and we aren't going back. We just, we don't know exactly where students are going to be at, whether it's learning loss or learning gain or, you know, and so that might be a timely thing. On the other hand, um, some people think at the end of the school year, they want to start in preparation for the next. Other folks say, you know what? We actually have an infusion of grant money. We want to do professional development in the summer. Terrific. Some people say we're going to start at the beginning of the year and work through it, but realistic and slow. What I like to do is have, um, and I do do PD proposals with, with schools, um, I want them to think about the short term and how they're going to get this turnkeyed, how we're going to involve the teachers, who will be taking the leadership piece. So a lot of stuff we did in the first session, actually. And, and to look at a, a, a guide or a map out, we literally map 
the plan. So there was a map of mapping, so to speak, and and lay out what would be in year one. What is the expectation year two? What are what's driving the work? I mean, if everyone's really concerned about language capacity, that's probably where you should start. I mean, you know, it every situation is different. And yes, a lot of places like to start with one area, but other places don't. They sometimes do. We're going to have multiple teams, like somebody asked a previous question, who are really skillful, and they're going to start working on drafts of consensus maps, and we'll turn them back to the teachers. Um, I've worked in really large districts that have a terrific district level curriculum um, uh, and professional development team, and they do a great job of laying out the roadmap and then turnkeying this with great PD so that the teachers actually start to have more ownership. and. I've worked in programs that maybe two or three years, and they've really got it cooking. They've got it there. It's really happening. Smaller places, it works. It can work faster, but not if people don't get along. I mean, so there's a lot of variables there, but I think the short term, you can get a good start. And depending on the size and scope of what you want to do, I think it's realistic to look at a year and a half to two years, and you'll start to see some nice results. You're going to start to see better communication. But it requires time and a commitment. And I think the tool really, the tools help the platforms really make it much faster and easier. So I hope that's helpful. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Jacobs. No, we really appreciate this. These three sessions have been so impactful for everyone who's attended, uh, for our team here at Chalk and uh, a little quick little, uh, you know, fun thing that we're hoping to plan. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to kind of get to it after all of you fill out the survey results. So Keenan, if you could move to the next slide. Uh, we are thinking of doing more PD with Dr. Jacobs going forward, um, but we want to learn a little bit more from you as the attendee and exactly what you're looking for going forward. Uh, so we're going to be sending out a webinar survey um, and you'll be entered uh, in, a, in a draw to win a $100 Amazon gift card if you do, uh, you know, submit. And, you know, it's really for us to get a chance to understand here. What, what are you looking to learn more? Do you want more curriculum PD? Do you want to look at assessment instruction? Um, and that's really going to be helpful to all of us as a team uh, to make that happen for future PD as we move forward along this year. Uh, but again, thank you so much for everyone coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs. Like it is immensely, we're so grateful. And wow. if you want to learn a little bit more about Chalk, please check us out. Thank you, everybody. It was really an honor. I had a great time. Awesome. I'm glad we ended on time today. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mama and Jenny's happy today. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Hi, everyone. Everybody. Take care. Thank you.